This is episode 238 of the Gold Squadron Podcast. I'm your host, Dion Morales, and today I'm joined by Marcel, when in doubt, roll out Manzano. I said roll it out. Big difference between roll out and roll it out. Yep. <laughs> I don't, I don't, okay you, okay, you put in the notes, bonus points if you guess what I'm referring to. What are you referring, well, I, I gotta well, break the cycle. things, like roll out means like you're leaving, like, hey, I'm gonna get out of here. And roll it out is like, take the dice and roll it out. Oh no, I thought you were talking about like bacon, like rolling out some dough. Cause we're making cookies. What, what's the topic today? You'll get it later, oh my God. <laughs> It's not your day, Dion. It's no, I know what you're I, – I am purposely – you know, I, I got to play, gotta play Look, the jester, right? Let's get past this now because we're going to be 10 minutes <laughs> – like last week, we'll be 10 minutes later, you'll be trying to say have the same argument on the same side and then find this out is, later. Th- this is true. This is true. Will Greedo's Sparkly Plasmas Hagwood. Good job, Dion. Hey. Got us there with plasmas. Plasmas. What? Plasma's on top. Ryan, the clock is ticking. Stan Azuski. Only about a week and a half, maybe? The baby could be here any moment. It could be now. It could be now. It could, you know, just like any moment. Yeah, they, if you see Ryan run, you know what happens. The phone is here. If I see a text that says, I got to go, I got to go. <laughs> He's just he's just running. All right. So um, as for announcements and news on Wednesday, December first, signups for Jank Tank Two will be live, friends. Uh, stay tuned to our Discord. Uh, we'll have information on our website. There'll also be a separate website with specifically information for Jank Tank Two. Um, but but we're ready to go. It's going to be happening. And if you sign up, if you're one of the first people to sign up on Wednesday when everything goes live, that night we actually will be live rolling random lists for people on stream. So you get to actually see your 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 lists be created and find out whether or not you got your original lists or maybe I decided to not allow you to keep a list and, and move on from there. But it should be a good time. Uh, I know uh, Farmer, Ryan Farmer is going to join me at some point, maybe for about an hour during that time. Uh, I need to figure out how to create a macro key for cut and paste on my keyboard because last time we did this, my pinky left pinky completely cramped up because of co- copy paste, that, that control button. So if you know how to do that, hit me up on Discord because I don't know how to yet. Um, but then the other thing we got going on is um, – we are uh, well ryan no shade ryan was in the tournament but we're (laughs) we're playing in the (laughs) in the crate team tournament and uh and we're in the top four and what i wanted to do is actually um we haven't talked a, a while about um like how things have been going in the tournament. We just come kind of like, oh, this this is going on. We haven't really talked about games. Like, I don't want to like old school Nova Squadron podcast full bat rep this. All right, that's a deep cut, by the way. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then it doesn't don't matter. But I, <laughs> but um, you know, I just want, kind of want to talk about how how did your last games go? How have things been going? Good, bad, or ugly? Um, yeah. So, who wants to go first? Let William go first. He's carrying us. It's true. <laughs> I'm, I might be, actually. Uh, I have won every single round so far. So uh, Clutch wins. Um, taking an old school list uh, with Jake, Wedge, and Han um, based off of Catch's success uh, with that similar archetype. Um, but yeah, it's actually proven like pretty flexible being able to bring like, uh, swapping out for like proton torpedoes when fighting like soon and Ada's things like that. Um, but then being able to like dial wedge back and maybe get a proton rocket on Jake. Um, 
I just was talking about plasmas. Actually, plasma torpedoes, when you know you're facing uh, a high shield, like low agility enemy, or I think, Dion, you were using it against A-wings. Like, you just need one one good plasma hit to go through, right? Both, both um, those plasmas got me ripping the shields off and half points. <laughs> Yeah, uh, sometimes, like, it is really nice to just know. Um, so, uh, and then Han. Han has been absolutely unstoppable uh, with, um, there's almost, like, no s true swarms left. Uh, at least, uh, I haven't faced a list that had more than four ships in it. So, Han has been getting it, like, the Bistan, I've been swapping that out for R2-D2 sometimes when I need more upfront damage. Um, but lately, man, uh, the uh, just Kanan and R2-D2, uh, that Han's so good. I don't know why we don't see more Han in like competitive play. I have to assume because swarms were such a powerful thing for so long, and he hasn't. He's not a fan of those. Yeah, he's actually uh, pretty good against Dash and. Uh... And all the other i fives that are out there right now. Uh, yeah, I don't think he's ever been bad. <laughs> I mean, they pulled him away from like broken, but uh, yeah, he's just good, very consistent. He like never feels like a one agility ship to me. Um, he always feels like a little bit more defensive. So uh, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I'll be like really utilizing that sideboard. I think it's the most interesting part of Crate Cup, experimenting with that. It's not Craig Culp. Craig, what is the actual name of it? Does anybody know? Fantasy like, Online something something. It's like Craig, Craig, season Craig Chris episode one and name. a half point two. <laughs> yeah. To a Craig Culp Online is the short way you put it. Oh, there okay. it is. That makes sense. We had to distinguish. <laughs> All right. Um, well, Ryan, how, 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 I know the, you guys got knocked out last week, but how have your games been going? How was your experience with the sideboard? What were you playing? Give us the deets. So, um, I had my same list the entire event. Uh, I had been undefeated up until this week. Um, I was flying Silencer, Kylo, Grudge, and two FO Bombers. That gave me, I believe, about 25-ish points to work with, which is pretty solid for kidding out the Bombers, but almost consistently across the entire event, I always had Sensor Scrambler on Kylo, I always had Proximity Mines and Electro Chaff on both of the generic FO Bombers. Bomblet Generator on Grudge, and then that allowed me to take uh, Automated Targeting Priority on both FO Bombers. I think that rounded it out to the full 200. And it worked out really well. The only time I switched some stuff up was took the Automated off in one matchup against low agility ships and put an eye on Miss Lilith. I never used on Grudge anyway, so... Um, ATP is pretty good, I think. Um, FO Bombers with Prox Mines are really good, especially when backed up by Grudge. And Kylo Silencer is the best Kylo, so that's what I opt for. Um, I ran into Andrew Oler, played him for the first time against his uh, Canadian friends, Kaylin Wong, and I forget who their third person was. I'd have to look it up. But, um, yep, Andrew and me had a really close game. A lot was of things it Ben Wetton? Hmm? Ben, ben Wetton? Witten? Maybe? can't remember. I can look it up real quick. But anyway, um, the, the game I had against Andrew Oler, we both learned something uh, from the game and how we wanted to approach certain things against each other. He took his, <clears throat> his um, Jin Urso Kyle Garvin Hera machine, and instead of having the Ben Thick, since he had, doesn't have as many, it was much room for all that right now, he now is just Wedge X-Wing, which is pretty good. <laughs> um, we talked about him. His sideboard was basically deciding whether or not he, what the last two points he wanted to take. He did think about Moldy Crow or not, actually, to free up some points, but he stuck with it. Considered selfless, which I thought he was going to take, since that seems even better to help keep Wedge and Hera alive and make people shoot at Garvin. But uh, it turns out when you don't land any bombs, because either A, you miss one, or he, or they move away from them. Or B, your ships get killed just the turn before they would have had the best bombing opportunity both times. Not going to cut it. Although I had the game 
in a pretty good position because I had really, really good chaff cloud launches. By the way, if you haven't played against a list that has two FO bombers with chaff clouds, you need to be aware of the map they can place the chaff clouds because you will have to deal with them. Just if you're going to have to deal with them, they will boost and launch it at you. That's jam and no action. Try not to be there, but it's hard. You're going to be jam. It's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Also, uh, what are... I've I've transitioned more to sensitive controls, Kylo. I like that a lot, actually. Um, and when you combine it with sensor scrambler, just pick them up and place them wherever you want in the first engagement when you decloak and you use sensitive controls. <laughs> you got to throw yeah, a sense here. on there, too, so you can be in that I sure that's also a thing you can do. I mean, it's good. It's good to have almost guaranteed information. <laughs> it's always always been a good thing. What about what about you, Marcel? How things been going? I know uh, this but, week was bad, but to just give us give us everything, you know. Yeah, no, yeah. This week was uh was was a rough one, but that's why I got a ow. I got a cat biting my toes. Actually, what I got. <laughs> um, that's what I got. Um. You and William bailing me out when I, when I have a week like this. But um, so I'm flying a hundred and twenty nine point, uh, well seventy one point sideboard. So a lot of points to play with. I have uh, Baby Anakin, Obi on a Delta, and Ahsoka on a Delta, and it is. Um, I have not flown knit the same way twice. So it, it's actually a lot of fun when you. Uh, the sideboards when you have that much to play with. I've done CLT Ahsoka with um, CLT Ahsoka with Chopper. I've done um, Baby Annie with my regular loadout, Collision Detector, Advanced Torpedoes Regen. I've done them with uh, with uh, Passive Sensors and Proton Torpedoes. I've done them with Passive Sensors and Ion Torps. Um, this last week, it didn't work out, but this last week I did uh, double sense because I was flying against uh, a five six six list, so I put sense on both Ahsoka and um, on both. I had Delta Seven B Ahsoka and and Obi with uh, sense on both Regen on Obi, and then passive sensors and ion torpedoes on Anakin to see if I can catch catch the I sixes. Um, so it's been it's it's been fun. However, I'm getting a little burnt out with the list to be to be uh, it, that happens to me every time. Every time I play something for an extended period of time, I just get bored. So I'm trying to. Like, you just gotta do it for two more weeks. It. Just two, two more weeks, weeks. Two more weeks. Yeah, yeah. It's two more weeks, and then I can put I, um I can put them on the can can put them away. Ahsoka though has been relatively um not relatively. It's been surprisingly better than I expected, regardless of what I end up putting on her. Whether I put on Delta Seven, CLT, Chopper, um, whatever it is, uh, just the double action every turn, action even after you get a red maneuver, or even after you get a red maneuver, you can still dial in a white maneuver and still get an action. I mean, it's uh, She's just very, very. She can do anything she wants. So she's a support ship. She's also a solo ship. So I'm, I'm having a lot of fun with 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 Ahsoka. So, I don't think Ahsoka gets enough uh, respect. Man, no, she is awesome. such. She's got the best of pilot ability, probably, if flying in, if not the best chassis as well. What's going on with Typo X Wing in the chat? I don't. I, I don't know. know. I don't know. Uh, I think I think something's wrong with his keyboard. Hopefully he's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been it's L M. It's like the right right side of his keyboard. Not in there, and then there's a random X. I don't know what's happening. I think something's wrong with his computer. Typo. I love you, and hopefully you're okay. <laughs> we're just gonna we're gonna keep going. Uh, for, for, for my part, um, I've kind of been in in an odd boat because what has happened on most weeks is you had Marcel and Will winning their games and then me not being available to play my game until the weekend. 
But because of most of those times, those first two games are won already, the third person's like, nah, never mind. Like, that happened to me, not this week, but the two other weeks before that. So going into this week, I wasn't feeling super confident to like in because I, 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 I was feeling rusty. Like I had played some jank tank games and all that, but I hadn't really gotten um, I had I hadn't gotten what I thought was enough reps with the list. But this week uh, I was able to get a W for the team, which pushed us into the top four. And uh, I was playing against four A Winks. It's uh, Joe Cogden. He's in Japan, so that was a fun time zone to uh, to try to schedule up. But, um, but yeah, four A wings, four sets of prockets, really scary. And um, I was I was able to to pick off half points with those plasma torpedoes, and um, and there was this. I would say the r road, the random order after dials really affected our games in in what I found very entertaining ways because we had this weird like he had ZZ on his on his, in his list, the four RZ two A wings, and I had ZZ in mine. Um, so this kind of like who's who's chasing who for most of the game, my ZZ was behind his, but because we never knew who would be moving win uh the maneuvers got kind of weird a couple of times but it was it was a great time uh, it was a really great time so um overall you know in in list building uh it's been really interesting to look at my options um to go you know between plasma torpedo proton torpedo on poe if i need like a, a really if i feel like i, I need to need a four dice uh mess around with uh heavy laser cannon on poe that was an interesting week but it didn't matter because the person didn't want to didn't end up wanting to play it was just like doing practice games with it but um but yeah it was it was a lot of fun it's been a lot of fun. I'm excited to see what happens this week. This week, I am playing against... Is it a Rebel list, I believe? I think you said it was a Luke, yeah, Leia, but, uh, and Ahsoka. Yeah. yeah, three fives. Yeah. So that'll be interesting. Yeah, so... Definitely we'll... don't bring Plasmas because... Uh, definitely Plasmas are bad against Leia. So. <laughs> hint, hint, Nari and... <laughs> I don't He's know. Totally not you'll, never, do you'll never, you'll never hit those ships with three dice steel. You might as well not even bother. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I gotta love it. But yeah, it's it's been a lot of fun uh, playing in a playing in a competitive event, um, especially in a team event, because with the limited amount of time I get to play. I feel like all my games have stakes. Like, it matters. I'm playing for the team. I'm not just playing, you know, random stuff on a Wednesday night, and I don't care if I lose. Like, I, I want to win these games. I'm going in with a different mindset. Um, honestly, I think if you guys were watching me play those games, you would be bored because, um, you know, I usually... You know, I'm I'm talking my maneuvers out loud when, like, you know, I'm oh, too hard and, and doing this. Um, but... I spent a lot of time just like super quiet and just kind of think thinking in my head and trying trying to catch any mistakes that I might be making in my mind um, as we're you know as I'm, as I'm going through the game. But I think that actually uh, leads pretty well into our topic for today that I wanted to hit, and that is risk assessment in X Wing. But before we do that. Today's podcast episode is brought to you by the Gold Squadron patrons. Patrons, becoming a patron makes you a part of the largest group of supporters that GSP has. Patrons have access to patron-only channels on Discord, and depending on what level you are, you get sent quarterly gifts. Our next wave features Pursuit Squadron, and voting for the Pursuit Squadron pilots is going on now. It wraps up this week, and uh, super excited about that. We've oh, it looks like already uh, it's been decided that Sonny Bounder is going to end up being the M3A pilot. Um, when I put up the vote for the Kimogila, I said, let's pretend like this is a real vote because it's going to end up being Tarani because you have Tarani, Dalen Oberos, and a generic uh, as the pilots. Um, but yeah, the other ones I think can, are potentially up for grabs. We'll see. We'll see how things end up shaping out, and uh, and then of course pretty soon here we have the, the the squadron leader. I'm curious to see where people go there. Um, but yeah, let's let's hit it here. Risk assessment in X-wing. 
Rich the second and X Wing. Now I want to start here. When I when I propose this as a topic, we kind of all kind of not hit it from different different ways but we kind of started latching on like other ideas that have to do with risk assessment uh and i 100 percent agree we can we can hit as many of these tangents as we want uh today is definitely just kind of a uh, a brainstorm more than anything and kind of what is our personal experience and i want to start by asking like how if i were to ask you to define risk assessment like what what is that when i say risk assessment ryan so it's a player's or person's ability to assess risk in their in a situation or various situations. Now, as pertains to X Wing specifically, it's your ability to assess if doing a if your choice in doing something, assessing the risk that comes with that. Your ability to say, I'm gonna dial in this maneuver, and you assess when you've made that decision if the risk in doing that is worth it under in your assessment you that's all you're just trying to do is assess if is that risk worth my effort or it's not even is it worth it you're just assessing if it even has a risk first turn of the game is a one straight risk probably not <laughs> but there might be a risk to it if someone says i'm gonna five straight be in your face and we're now jousting in the gutter and you decided oh i didn't know they were gonna do it that quickly and then you've had to figure out from there if that one straight was a risk or not in the game afterward that's more risk analysis by that point but action decision as well is taking the action of doing certain ones a risk how much of a risk is it is it worth it and situationally in the game depending on the game stay itself how far you're up how far you're down if you're willing to take certain risks and assess if it's necessary to do a risk if you're up enough in a game. A lot of times it's not. Uh -huh. Or other times, and I'm, I'm pretty sure Marcel's a big fan of this, I'm just here to kill as many ships as possible, risk or not. Um, some other players might just run their ships away as soon as they get up in points and just make, make their opponents make mistakes to close back in. Or if you're down in a game, you need to make the correct risk assessment to decide this risk is worth the potential reward and you're more in. You got to risk it more for the biscuit. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Um, Marcel or Will, do you guys anything else you want to kind of tack on with that definition of what is risk assessment? Okay. So just wanted to kind of check that. I think that was a really concise um, definition of that. Now, what I, what I want to do is let's for especially newer players and if you're a seasoned veteran this is always good to to uh to practice these things is let's define risk assessment in different parts of the game because i think that there's different moments where you can essentially analyze what's happening across the table from you and decide whether something is you know, it's going to be bad for you. Um, they're, they're the, the decision that your opponent made in turn zero, turn zero we're defining as decisions made before the game, what obstacles they brought, what lists they brought. Um, let's go ahead and start there. Uh, Will, what would you say would be an example of – let's – Let's talk about your uh, your crate cup list. So, what obstacles did you bring for your list? Uh, debris, debris, big, big debris. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, and that's because it works really well with Canaan, right? Kanan. And, and right, and like Han as well. Han yeah. likes to be as close to obstacles as possible. Um, so I don't want to risk taking rocks. Um, and then yeah, the the interaction of canaan clearing stress when you hit a debris is too good to pass up so then when what would be the obstacles you would not like what would be the, the for lack of a better term like the worst obstacles to come across with your opponent uh, having brought probably. those um big rocks probably uh because I, I had to be a lot more careful with my hom if they're gas clouds whatever i'll just land on them but obviously you can't land on a rock and still shoot. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's that is I mean, that, that's exactly what I want to go because now you end up whether you're first or second player. Now you have a decision to make. All right, those rocks, my opponent has them. If you're the first player, are you? Are you gonna want to go and move, or like decide oh, yeah. where those rocks oh, yeah. go, or are you gonna place yours? Uh, ooh, uh, I think I'd, I might do a little bit of both, but I think I, I think I always start by grabbing uh, the worst obstacle and putting it somewhere that I know I can avoid it or at least fight or fight around it on my terms. Mm -hmm. Now, Marcel, in my experience, your what I'm going to say obstacle theory has been very, I will use the word avant-garde. Um, if you've seen live video of Marcel, his obstacle placement looks something like a quarter flip onto the table. Um, and I think that goes more back to the mental game. It's kind of like, I don't care where these are and he's trying to trigger people, but, but, uh, <laughs> Marcel, thoughts on obstacle risk assessment? So, um, uh, that that is a little bit true about the like the mind game and, and just being like, I don't care where they go. Uh, that's a little bit true because I don't know where you're going to put yours, so I'm just going to put it anywhere. And um, why am I going to try to tip my hand on what I want to do based on my rock placement? Because... Um, I, I like to play by reading the opponent and by seeing what the opponent is physically doing, is thinking about. I mean, that's just the, I mean, that's just how I like to play. So I don't want to give anything away. So I just tend to be. That's why I play messy. I don't mean messy like like. That's why I just like throw it out there and I set dials a little bit quick because I'm. I'm just letting it go. Now. Uh, one of the things that it's helped me in most situations, because I don't do it good all the time, is it's helped me to be able to fly around rocks regardless of whether they're in a favorable or not favorable position. Mm -hmm. And as it relates back to risk assessment, um, more recently, after Alderaan, I've been flying swarms. I've been flying six and seven ship lists. And with six and seven ship lists, well, I've been flying a six or seven ship uh, list small base list and then I've also been flying um, three slavers <laughs> I've been doing that quite a bit just three slavers teched out with like really uh, funny um, all kinds of fun stuff on three slavers you can get a whole bunch of toys on them but even with the slavers and with the the uh, seven, six or seven ship lists I've been bringing the biggest rocks possible and the biggest asteroids possible, uh, which sounds counterintuitive because you know, especially with the, um, with the big ships, is like, well, the likelihood of you landing on them is is bad. But I'm I'm looking at it the other way. I'm looking at it like I feel confident that I know I'm not going to put myself on a rock. I feel more confident that I'm not going to put myself on a rock than my opponent is not going to put themselves on a rock. And even with the slavers, um, I've been throwing them like right that center in the in the rock asteroids and just playing around with um, not hitting rocks. And it makes me a little predictable, but it's fun. But um, and and with the with the with the small base swarms again, just flying around the, the rocks becomes more of a protection because with 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 a swarm. One of the biggest, you know, one of their biggest things, if you're not flying them in a block formation, one of their biggest things is they're going to get picked off because, you know, people are going to arc dodge you and they're, you know, they're going to shoot you without you shooting them because it's their low initiative things. But they can't arc, do arc dodge you if you're in the middle of the rocks because, you know, you're probably flanked by rocks. If they try to arc dodge you, that means they have to take the long way around, which they're not shooting you. And if they are shooting you, they they're taking bad shots. So, um, yeah, I don't even know how it relates so much to risk assessment. It's just, I'm, I don't know how you, how you tie that back to risk assessment and obstacles, but I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's counterintuitive to what you would want to bring to what's favorable to your style of list to bring those things. But, um, 
you can if if you think you can move around them better than the other person then then then, then why not um did that make sense at all because it kind of it started making sense in my head at first and then like halfway through <laughs> and i'm like I, I was just jibber jabbering and i'm like wait no, you guys, I, I think I th we got the information we were looking for. There were some extra nuggets around the way. Ain't nothing wrong with extra nuggies. Somebody just drop a little extra in your bag. I ordered a five piece. I got six bonus nuggie. It's cool. Yeah, but I guess the, I guess the bottom line is it's not, you know, it's not, um, I'm not, it's not risk. I mean, there is risk assessments. Like I understand it's, it's not favorable mm -hmm. for me or because it's more favorable to just set a cloud and, land on it or it's more or just shoot right through it but if it's more favorable for me it's probably going to be more favorable for my opponent as well so he here's so a question i'm trying to make it difficult for them what what obstacles did you choose for your cray cup online list uh i had i think i had gas clouds for that one okay but that's because i had that early on when gas clouds still gave you the free evades and yeah. I was flying that, and I have not changed it or touched the list or done anything to it since, like, week one. So that's why they're still on there, because I never touched it. But oh, okay. if I were to have changed that up after the gas clouds stopped giving free evades, I probably would have done big rocks. Okay, cool. And what, are, what, what about you, Ryan? Risk assessment, obstacles. Hmm. I think... Uh... <laughs> There's normally not a lot that I look into too much as a risk beyond if what I'm about to place on the board is already what my opponent wants in the first place. I try and figure out like, okay, I'm going to, a lot of times I take big obstacles because I'm bringing many ships and I want to make sure the aces have the least amount of room possible and I feel confident moving around it. So, or on them, droid sword, neat. Uh, make my nest of rocks for my struts. So I try and figure out if putting certain obstacles, especially with the first couple placements, because a lot of times those first two placements for each person control where the last two are going to be. So it's more so those first two on each side tend to dictate what everything else is going to end up. So if I'm placing one of my first two in a place that I think my opponent already wants to go, I'm effectively giving them a placement but then I just assess, is it still more advantageous for me? Is that still what I want anyway? Even if that's what they want, are they wrong? Are they right? I don't know. I mean, we'll find out in the game and if it matters. Uh, if we, if, if where I put that rock is going to make a big deal. Ideally, in the first couple rock placements, it should make a big deal. It's normally kind of in the middle-ish. So that's kind of the only thing that runs to my mind a risk assessment risk assessment for obstacles is is i am i already giving my opponent what they want cool cool i like that i like that and for for myself when it comes to obstacles at the time i know that gas clouds don't give their their effect anymore but essentially what i usually am assessing is when an opponent brings not the obstacles that I would have preferred. How does that affect my list, right? So, for instance, if somebody brought debris, and uh, and this is starting to get a little bit into the the list assessment, which we'll get to next. Um, you know, how does how does that affect how I'm going to fly? You know, if I hit one of those, how bad is the stress going to be, and how do I get it out of the way, um, or put it in a spot where I don't think we're going to engage to not have to deal with the risk of taking that stress or if i'm playing against um you know at the time gas clouds that gave that free evade and uh where can i place it for instance so that i didn't have to deal with that defensive bonus or maybe i wanted it and for whatever reason i thought my opponent shouldn't have brought gas clouds and they're actually benefiting me um you know right now I would say that the obstacle that scares me scares me the most is probably the uh, the debris, just because of that stress possibility that can really affect the maneuvers the most, even more than than rocks, um, because you could at least you know just five straight, four straight through a rock and be able to still get a shot if as long as you end up on the other side. Um, well, it's I think your coordinator as well. True that. True that. Yeah. 
So got got to watch out for for that debris. Um, even though in my list, I brought the brie. <laughs> I brought the brie uh, to bring it in uh, in the tournament because I do think they're they're the scariest ones. And I look my opponent in the eye and say, "You touch it. I'm not gonna touch it. You touch." It. All right. So now let's go ahead and head to lists. All right. You're about to set up the game. You're looking across the table. Your opponent has X list. Risk assessment things. What are you looking for? Obviously, you have to. This is a very obvious point of risk assessment, right? These are the things that worry me in my opponent's list. I mean, it, it feels a little obvious, but I think we needed to say it, right? See? The silence is telling. It's exactly what. what. Well, no, no. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to. I, I was, I'm trying to see where you're going with this one so um you have in your obstacles your i mean you have in in your bullet points obstacles list and setup mm -hmm. i thought when you were going to lists i thought you were going to go into our own lists not the opponent list i so mean are you talking about risk port... assessment in your own lists or in well the, risk assessment point? in you have your list can't change right so, no, but in list building, it's there's there's that's what I thought you were going. Right, no, I'm not going that way. I'm talking about okay. opponent lists. We can hit that too. This is the thing is that the entire game is risk assessment, isn't it? You're on, you're you're always going like, this is bad, this is bad. How do I mitigate both bads equally, or which bad is worse, right? So um, I want to talk about specifically, you're about to start a game, you look across the table. I mean, the first thing I'm looking at is the different initiatives. Do they have someone lower than, than me who can block me? Because do they have a high initiative person who can move after me and always arc dodge me as well? Uh, so taking those into account, uh, if it's is it gonna, a whole block, is it a swarm that's going to move together as one unit? Uh, then I need to not risk uh, maybe jousting that um, unless I feel I have the superior jousting. Um, then I'm not sure whether and same thing with the blocker, right? Like is is that a risk devoting time to chasing after the blocker to take that tool away from them? Or she go after a more important piece. Uh, that's the um, I think like things that do aerial, aerial denial as well, uh, bombs, mines, uh, anything that I don't know if really have. I guess turrets kind of have mm -hmm. aerial denial. Yeah. Well, you know, there's – I know – you tell me for you guys. I know there's times where I will look at an opponent's list and they brought a, a threat. And I have to decide, okay, they brought, I, they brought these bombs. But in order for me to win this game, I have to not care about those bombs. Like there, there, are, there are moments, depending on, on what, you, what list you have, which in our arbit arbitrary conversation, the, the lists on both sides, they're not fixed, right? We're, they're, we're just kind of talking about them in a vacuum. But there, there are definitely going to be moments where you look across, the, they, you identify a threat. Okay, this person has brought proton torpedoes this is a four dice attack with a crit and i have a ship that has no shields or very low shield count um you have to decide are, are you gonna go chase after that thing and try to kill it before it gets the proton torpedo off or are you going to accept it and how are you going to do that and then continuing from there we hit setup so my question here is I would say that there's there's a couple of different types of setups um, in general, right? We have what I'm going to call block formations, right? It's some type of square-ish thing um, that moves as a single unit altogether, basically one giant arc. You have uh, more of a spread formation. They're kind of together, but maybe they have some different angles. Um, a lot of really good vulture players use what I want to call like a spread formation. They're not all one square, but they do, they dance do using the barrel rolls very cleverly to keep different angles covered. Um, you, you have uh, the non-committal um, side to side setup 
classic Marcel Manzano. You start with things facing in and you decide if you want to switch sides you decide if you want to turn in you decide if you turn in one side you basically don't make any decisions on the first turn you also have the self block to open right we're just kind of stalling uh, on that could be either side left right middle um all of these different setups give you different pieces of information um and and that you know depending on your list your risk assessment on looking at their setup and deciding what you think they're going to do. Now, going into my question that I want to throw at you guys is, I'm going to say setup and opening moves. How, if, if I had to make you choose, what's more important, your setup and opening moves or your opponent's? Mm. What do you mean? Can you elaborate on that? If which obviously they're both important, but my question is in the beginning part of the game, are you prioritizing what you do or what your opponent does? So for instance, an example of that, an easy one would be somebody who has a fixed setup is prioritizing themselves. Every game I do this thing because it creates these opportunities for me versus you know maybe you have a starting formation but you are now you're more read and react okay if i see this across the table i'm gonna start doing this you don't necessarily have a fixed set of moves and there's a spectrum of that so where are you at okay so um I'm gonna. You jumped over list before you asked us, so I'm just gonna throw a little bit on there about list risk assessment. I'm sure. Gonna put them. Yeah. Put them. Put them together. So, Go for it. So I got a really good and horrible example of uh, risk assessment, which is the top four match that I had that I got wiped on, um, a couple weeks ago or a month ago, yeah, in one of the qualifiers where I was flying dash against dash in the dash ahsoka jake one that in in the risk assessment before playing that game and before being familiar my mind dash is a problem it's a risk where in reality if you go back and play it again or if i go back and play it again in my mind dash is a problem because dash gets 20 actions and dash gets 20 actions because there's there's jake and Ahsoka and Jake and Ahsoka, you can deal with. Like you can kill, especially with two I fives. My approach should have been kill that extra action now, and then now we have a more even match. So that's just a a missed. It's it, it's a risk assessment gone wrong. I did not assess the risk accordingly. I, I assessed the true risk that is dash, but. I didn't, you know, with Jake just being Jake, I'm like, ah, it's just Jake and I4. I can deal with him later. Where in reality is like, no, I should deal with him now. I think uh, you or William said, uh, like, you just you, you just put it in your head, like, oh, I'm going to uh, accept the consequences of, you know, getting shot by these other things while I'm taking care of this. Like, uh, it's, it's kind of a um, an accepted loss. Like I'm okay getting shot by a couple of floor dice guns, couple couple turns in order to get rid of the support. Uh, another example would be uh, I played uh, Tyler Tippett twice with um, his his Vader and four uh, Tie Fighter blocking thing, and in both games I completely ignored the Tie Fighters. I went straight at Vader. Because I know that if I go around and kill the TIE Fighters, Vader is just going to be end game, just chewing me up. So in both games, I went in and I killed Vader. And then the TIE Fighters, you know, you, you, no matter what's left over, like they, what's left over has a good opportunity to do clean up on TIE Fighters. Um, and it went well in those situations. But it's those situations, like I said, like I knew that the TIE Fighters were going to be throwing dice at my back and have a favorable position on me but that's because if i don't kill vader early you know it's it, i'm gonna lose late so those are the 
the the the risk assessments that that you got to make is you got to know when when the when you have to kill the support because the support enables the true risk or when you have to kill the risk because the support is more of a a um, it's more of a nuisance it's more like they're they're not there to enable the 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 powerful piece they're there to to be kind of a a kite you know they're they're kiting you by coming at you they're not kiting right. you by running away if, if that makes sense um, yeah i would like the toughest the toughest lists are definitely those that like there's no clear option you're like the, all of these things are bad i don't i don't know i don't know what and i usually boy you go as a kind of like a um target of opportunity is the phrase we've used before uh yeah, and I was gonna say Grim Grimwolf probably put it better, saying that it's risk assessment or threat assessment, because that's pro I mean they're they're kind of interchangeable, right? The, you know, the yeah. threat in the this risk. in this sense, yeah, yeah. Um, and as far as the the set the actual question that you asked about setup, um, I think that's why I choose not to be committal with my setups because. I can react, and if I have a, if I have ships that move before yours, I'm going to play slowly. If I have ships that move after you, then I can then I then I can kind of lead it. So uh -huh. I don't think there's much of a um, you know it, it it's 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 a cat and mouse game. It's it's one of those situations where if you're moving first, you want to make the player that's moving second tip their hand. If you're moving second, mm -hmm. then then you kind of force the issue. Cool. Thank you, thank you. And now I want to I want to move on to uh, to the next part I want to talk about was you know we talked a little bit about lists, um, we talked about setup. Now, win conditions. How how does win condition and risk assessment kind of go together? I want to I want to throw this in your court, Ryan. What do you think? So. Um... A lot of that is also the sort of threat feel of it. So if the if your win condition you've determined, at least you need to do step one. There's like steps to win conditions in X-Wing because you don't always get to full destruction as much as we like to. You don't always get there. But there are checkpoints along the way that can help you get to that win condition or at least versions of that win condition so that you've taken down either their end game or enough pieces to where their end game doesn't have enough power to take down what you have left so it's assessing risk wise should i go for the end game piece or should i go for the other stuff or if everything's end game what is the most threatening end game piece that's there or if there's nothing really end game and it's all just meant to be in your face kill you jousty stay alive whatever it is what parts or pieces that construct that can you take down to help snowball it towards your win? So whether it's linchpins, like if you're in a Rebel 4 ship, or even 5 ship, uh, things like Her Hera or Jake are great linchpins that help drive a lot of aspects within a list that you can go after that maybe they're not Ahsoka, the A-Wing, that's in more of an endgame piece, but it can drive a lot of what will allow your game to, uh, or your opponent to win the game. Or if like Marcel alluded to in the Vader defender and friends, whatever it is, Academy ties, fifth bro or, or fifth brother, seventh sister, whatever combination you're putting together. Um, you do need to try and do what you can to get Vader as much as possible. The difficulty is if your opponent knows that you also need to factor in the risk of if they know what you're trying to go after they're going to make it as difficult for you as possible while putting their other pieces in a spot to damage you along the way so it it almost turns into a few turns into the game you're it, there's a lot of a little bit of baiting a little bit of not too too much commitment but threatening maybe um or at least uh maybe even putting pressure on opponents. Maybe the, the piece that they want to bait is now being pressured so hard, it's got to turn away, and now you can refocus back in because if they even think about turning that bait back in, they are 
wiped off the board too easily. So there's a lot of aspects to the, you know, what what are you going to go after? Is it worth it? Is it something your opponent already knows? Do they play around that correctly? And then assess from there how you can position yourself in the best way to react or proactively pressure your opponent into favorable positions for yourself. All right, cool. Now, there's a time to make a safe choice, a calculated risk, and take uh, uh, you know a high risk. You know, this there is a um, you know you you've decided I have to do X or Y, otherwise I'm going to lose the game. Will, you want to hit, hit that a little bit? When, when are you doing what? What are these game situations? How are maybe early game, mid game, late game? I mean, that's the assessment. Kind of goes what to Marcel said, pointed out earlier, uh, was that when you see those lists, or when you see those ships, that you say, like, this ship is going to lose me the game if it's still on the board, full health, doing whatever it needs to, right? Spending its modifiers on offense. Uh, that's the kind of threat that we're talking about here where you have to, you have to occupy that ship. Uh, same thing of looking at um, like uh, someone who wants to joust. If you're like this ship or this list does, does so much upfront damage, whether you got like munitions or uh, say something like three dice rerolls, like some sort of like Sloan interceptor swarm or something like that, right? Uh, where if you just go anywhere near this thing and it, let, it lets you concentrate fire, uh, you you just have to, uh, or that, that you're not gonna survive that. It's not gonna trade well. Uh, so that's the things that I look for is like, what pieces am I willing to risk trading a further other piece and a lot of that comes down to like okay i'll trade my support piece for yours because yours is more expensive than mine or i'll trade one of my line troops for one of yours uh if i, I benefit from that trade uh i kind of think about that like chess like i'm always willing to like as long as it's not my king or queen i'm willing to trade any piece right uh, well, almost any piece. As a piece is that are worth equal amounts, right? Uh, you, just like in chess, like that's not a good risk. If I'm tr uh, if I have to trade a bishop for your pawn, like I'm not going to give up my bishop for something cheap like that. Uh, so I've never done where, that. I mean, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes you can bait it though. You just bait it just <laughs> enough, uh, and you can you can find that win condition. And I think that's the that's the most challenging part about risk assessment, is because you could look and be like, okay, well, Darth Vader defender, that's bad. But how uh, how do you understand your win condition enough? to understand when and how much you need to put pressure into that particular ship uh, or pieces, right? Sometimes it's like a combo piece, like we see like a, what was it, like Tarani and Justero together, right? Uh, sure, Justero can shoot twice, but he's not really the threat in that, right? Um, so you have to assess essentially a way to a way to be tyranny um whatever that would entail anything that's not in his bullseye right mm -hmm. like you can't that's the i guess the risk reward there right is uh you can't give up your position to get uh to give your better or give your opponent a better position mm -hmm. man uh these are uh, tough, tough concepts uh, to even to even wrap our head around. Well, we've been it, playing all this game for years, and like it's still something that like, okay, I, I I know how to do this. I know what I want to do, but how do we go about doing that mm -hmm. without losing out on too much? Right, because essentially, I will tell you, most of these topics that I come up with are things that are in the back of my head when in like during a game, I make I make a mistake, right, and and. 
most of the time you don't realize it was a mistake until after the dials are set people are moving that your opponent makes that one move you're like how did i not see that you know how did i not assess this risk that this ship was going to be able to to flank me after doing a three turn boost and now my most valuable piece is dead you know or you know whatever whatever the move might be um so he, here's the next kind of step i want to take taking risks it, it, marcel i want to go i want to go to you here first is there a right time and a wrong time to be risky i'm gonna start with that question i kind of want to see how you respond because i got a I, I got a sneaky third question that goes with that okay uh is there a right time or a wrong time to be uh, risky. risky to take yeah, risks of course, of course there's always a um right time and a wrong time uh and that's usually like the monday morning quarterback when you you know it depends on how it turned out right right uh, i think the more the more predictable thing is if you're ahead if you're winning it's you know the wrong time to be risky if you're if you're losing it's the the right time is to, to take risk but um i would say it's it, it again goes back to reading people and and reading the game is it's not, you know, whether you're win or winning or losing, the best time to take a risk is when the opponent doesn't anticipate it. Uh, it's more important than if you're up or if you're behind. Because if, if you're losing and you're going to say, well, I'm going to play risk averse and I'm just going to hide behind this gas cloud or hide behind here and I'm going to run five forward, if it's predictable, then you may be putting the dice in your favor by making them roll range three shots, bad shots through a gas cloud or, or a rock or something like that. Like they're taking bad shots. So you're, you're making the right call, but you're giving them shots. You're giving them an opportunity. And when it's unexpected that, that they're expecting that, that, you know, you to bug out and then they go chase you and then, ah, no, I'm, um, you know, I, I, I did this hard one that you could have blocked or, or, or had you gone slow, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the end of the road for me, but now I'm behind you and, and it's going to take you three or four turns to, for you to get your guns back on target. So it's, um, it's not as easy as be risk averse when you need to win because you're behind. No, when you need to win, when you're ahead of points and then take risk when you're down, it's um, the best time to take a risk is when it's least expected. Because if it's not expected and they do, they go after the predictable move, that's usually like what separates, um, That that's usually what will win your tournament. It's those, those, those those moments where you do the unpredictable and the unpredictable pays out for you i think my favorite game um of of seeing this risk reward being weighed off and ridiculous moves being uh put in the dials is marcel you versus duncan howard at worlds 2019 like go if you haven't watched that game on our youtube channel go pull it up it is ridiculous absolutely ridiculous fantastic um but there were just there was about three or four turns in a row where i could not tell you what was going to be in that dials and nobody when they were revealed nobody knew like like what why and then it was this crazy game of cat and mouse absolutely fantastic but there was you know there was there was risk in all the moves and uh the most ridiculous one was quite entertaining yeah if you haven't seen it yet i'm not going to tell you because i want you to go watch the video don't, so don't spoil it yeah um and then the, the next thing i want to talk about is uh ryan i want to toss this to you now we're in we have this random order after dials how has risk assessment or how will risk assessment kind of change as 
it be uh, now that random order after dials is the official way to play well it becomes another aspect in your dial decision making you need to if you have the same magic initiative you need to have the risk assessment to decide is my maneuver that i'm dialing in going to be uh how how effective it's going to be in each scenario and if it's worth it to say dial in something that you're counting on being a player to try and because it's going to be so advantageous if you get it it's so it's worth it even if if you don't get the player order that you needed to execute said maneuver or plan that you had going wrong so it's the assessment of deciding am i going to dial this in taking the 50 50 shot if i get it it's a big deal if i don't get it sucks maybe it's not as bad as you think and it could still work out am i gonna take the path of okay i'm doing a maneuver that's compensating on the other side of things it's compensating for the chance that i won't be able to complete it because i think i'll get blocked by a same initiative a lot of times this happens at low initiative counts um so i'm dialing in a maneuver that could still work in my favor if i go first but if I go second, my arc or where I am is still beneficial to where I think I'll be blocked. Um, I've done something like that. Uh, I may have described in a previous episode where I had an arc 170 that I wanted to do a, a certain maneuver or like cover a certain area with its firing arc. If I would move first, would have done still what I wanted to do. Um, and blocked up my opponent chips. But if I uh, go second, I'm counting on being blocked. Don't have my action, sucks. But I'm still covering generally where I want to cover with my arc. Um, I know someone who was flying a Vader Defender. They were counting on that 4K. They wanted to be first player to make sure I know this is going to fit. They weren't first player. And their other, the other opponent's I-6 decided to occupy where that 4K was. Didn't go very well. The space is my space. So, yeah. So, <laughs> there, you know, there, there'll be those times where your high initial ship, they want to go where they want to go. And actually being first player is advantageous. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting how Road has shifted that, that dynamic, too, if we think about that. We're always so used to, and it's normally better to be second player throughout most of the game. But some of, sometimes now you got you got those turns at any initiative. You want to be first. You want to occupy that space. You want this space is mine. I don't want anyone to go here. I want to take my actions. So um, I think it's mostly on the risk assessment side, deciding if what you're dialing in is is a risk. First, is it a risk? Second, if it is a risk, how bad is it if you don't get what you want? Or if you do get what you want, how advantageous is that for you? Weigh the two, do your checks and balances of road, and go from there. I love it. Love it. All right. So the last thing I want to hit here is, you know, we, we've talked about risk assessment uh, in a couple of different ways. And just kind of i want to hit personally you know how has road changed how you approach risk assessment in the game and if so how i'm just, i'm just kind of curious um remember the, these type of episodes we're just we're just kind of oh, it's just open thought time maybe maybe it hasn't affected you uh, i'm just curious will uh i think it's definitely affected me in, in the turns that it would matter, right? Like two I6s looking right at each other, uh, both blocking each other's K turns or something like that. Or um, things like you said, Dion, like uh, a non-turreted ship chasing a turreted ship at the same initiative gets really awkward. Because you, for me, I have ended up always just taking the conservative move. Whatever lands me the action if I move first, if that makes sense. Um, because you can't, I have a hard time turning away from any battle, uh, knowing that a block's coming, you know? Um, 
but I, I think it's made me just plan to be first player each time and hopefully that is advantageous um i think it's uh, I, I think overall it's made me more uh conservative on those turns that it matters where like i said that, that my action is going to be super important versus there's um, i i feel like i take less risks marcel uh i think it's it's um yes it has changed but i think it's changed in um in my not uh, the risk assessment has made me change what I use to do risk mitigation. So, so it's, cha what, it's changed your list building a bit. It's changed my list building, and it's also changed my my flying because mm -hmm. I, I I happen to I, I purposely try to not put myself in a situation where it's a fifty fifty. Uh, goes back to the, like the rocks thing that i was saying earlier like i bring the worst rocks because i trust myself to fly over through those rocks better than my opponent uh same thing it's is when i'm flying i'm trying to put myself in a position where there like there's very few of those 50 50 scenarios because i'd rather try to not have have it be a 50 50 have it be like my choice of the dial over your choice of the dial if that makes any sense and in the list building, it's it's um, definitely changed in the list building because in any situation, you're always going to end up in those situations. You can try to avoid it, but you're always, you know, it, it's it's um, it's like one of those things where, you, you know, you're playing American football, for those of you not, not, not American. When you're playing, you know, American football NFL or you're watching it and everything is perfectly coordinated you know like every everybody has their exact place to be the quarterback can have their eyes closed and throw it because no they know exactly what's going to happen but as soon as the ball gets tipped and it starts rolling around then you just chaos. have like 22 people <laughs> piled up on top of each other like it, it, it exactly it's like chaos is you know there's there's absolutely zero plan or anything and mm -hmm. that's how x-wing is a lot of the time you 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 set up you know you spend five or six turns getting that perfect engagement and showing up and i'm going to be at range three just out of arc um and you may get it but one or two turns after that it's just chaos now everybody's just like like mushed up in the middle so that's usually mm -hmm. how it ends up so what i've done is i've tried to build into the list things to mitigate that risk um more you know ryan was saying sensitive controls on kylo you know that that's a great idea sensitive controls on kylo one because kylo has force but i think we can all agree that one action is better than no actions so when you're moving second you're trying to hope to get that double action like the double reposition or the reposition and target lock if the choice is maybe a double action or maybe zero actions, I would rather guarantee that one action in the system phase because now it's guaranteed. So I'd rather be like, okay, uh, this is where I want to be. I missed. Mm -hmm. So I'm still going to guarantee one action because one action is better than, than, than no action. So that that's, you know, things like that or things where uh, I think William might have said this a week or two ago where you're flying more, or maybe Ryan, I don't know, somebody, one of you said it, where you're flying more of the same initiative ships because that way you can guarantee that, okay, I don't know where you're going to be, but I know where I'm not going to be. So I'm going to move this piece out of the way because this piece is the one that really needs that action. So you can create your own screen. So you can you can use the ship that, you know, the, the front ship, the screen, Say, if I move first, I know where I'm going to be, and both, both ships are going to get in action. But if you move first, this ship is going to get out of the way because the second ship is going to guarantee that action. So, uh, yeah, every so so like yeah, every space that you occupy on the previous turn, you you are you have the ability to control what happens to that space in the following turns when you have the same initiative. 
Exactly, exactly. And that's, you know, um, an added benefit of flying all same initiatives. So it, it um, so yeah, I, I would say, and also coordinators. I think coordinators went up in stock a ton because coordinators can impact the board without having to face the board. So again, you know, I said, you know, in football, you get everybody that, you know, when there's a fumble, everybody scrambles and gets to the center. The coordinator would be that one that is starting to run ahead to maybe set the blocks just in case one of your guys picks up the ball. They have the block set up so you can, you know, you can go in. The coordinators don't necessarily have to get into the scrum. They can just continue, you know, Jake, not Jake, because Jake's a, a bad example. Uh, but, you know, like, you know, any any of them. Le uh, Hera, I guess Hera would be the best example. Hera can just go around or uh, Kanan or Kyle Katarn. You know, they just need to be somewhere in the vicinity to still impact the the board. Awesome. Well, I mean, th that's a topic today. Like, you know, like I said, some of these topics end up uh, just – kind of off the top of my head, something I want to talk about. Super random thing that has nothing to do about X-Wing. Um, no spoilers here, but I started watching Hawkeye, the show. Again, I told you, it's super random, right? Started Ooh, watching Hawkeye. Hawkeye. And I had never realized something, and then Devin said this, and now I can't unsee it. Guys, doesn't Marcel kind of have a very similar facial structure as the Hawkeye actor? Uncover your face. Marcel, uncover your face. Do you see it? Do you see it? That's what I'm saying. I really need it's to all, see it's, it's, some it's side it's by side here. The side by side. All right, all right, listen, I like Devin was like, Marcel kind of looks like Hawkeye. And I was like, what? What do you mean? And then I looked at it and I was like, Oh, mm, yeah. I guess, I guess you got like the wide jawline, like the low cheeks might be the way to say it. I don't know how to describe it. I think it's the lower Thanks half. Thanks calling it double. <laughs> what? No. <laughs> no, you got to get a – if you start getting a beard, you got to – or if you start getting a double chin, you got to get a beard. Look at that. Cam and <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying. I, I don't know what it is. I haven't done a side by side comparison, but if you want to do the analysis, post some pictures on our Discord. I think that would be a fun. <laughs> Marcel's like, Dion, what are you doing? Listen, <laughs> wild card. It's December. All the tournaments are over. You can't, you can't. I, content can't control me because it's literally just what's on the top of my head. All right, so. <laughs> That that's it. You guys want to bring up anything else? We still we still got so, a little bit of time. Public service announcement. Uh, this is not to go off on a tangent. Tangents are fine. This up, is tangent uh, time. This is tangent no, no, time. No 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 no. This is not. We, we're not going to go off on on this. Other than you brought up shows we're watching. Uh, Amazon Prime. If you're not giving your Amazon Prime to Dion, give it to somebody else. Fearless Gundark. But. Um, on Prime, that uh, Wheel of Time episode. I haven't seen episodes, it yet. Is it good? They are ridiculously good, in my opinion. Um, we watched the fourth one, and Kayla was like, I, I, I read uh, the first 11 books, believe it or not. So I read the first 11 books for the Wheel of Time from Robert Jordan. Um, so I kind of know what's happening, but Kayla was like, nope, we're watching episode four again because I want to see if I missed anything, any little clues there. Uh, it's really good. It's probably the best show that Amazon Prime's done, and I'm a big fan of The Boys, and they did The Boys, and I think this one's probably better than The Boys. So anyway, um, neither here nor there. Back to Star Wars. No, I'm, 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 on the, I'm on the what we watch movies and TV show tangent now. <laughs> Let's go. Um, so uh sarah and i got netflix just recently we haven't caught up with a lot of the netflix original stuff she's been really enjoying lock and key i haven't watched it but she's personally a big fan of like horror movie occult thriller stuff it's it's not like horror at all but it's like very um i don't know like it, it just has occult aspects i guess or like supernatural for sure mm -hmm. um, which is cool uh, we caught up with Cobra Kai. I was excited to actually finally be able to watch that. Um, I know Marcel has this little rivalry. If you haven't seen Marcel and Duncan go at it, like it's Johnny Lawrence and Danny LaRusso, 
you haven't seen true in life x all right um uh we've been watching uh i i caught up with the castlevania series that's really good not watch with your little ones that is a mature rated content movie but great animation great story not really a, a big castlevania fan at all my friends just recommended it to me it's really enjoyable um and watching the new live action adaptation of cowboy bebop has been enjoyable i know a lot of people have been kind of like ripping on it a little bit because it's hard to match the level of nostalgia quality and feel to the original animation version of cowboy bebop but i think it's still fun and enjoyable to watch Uh, I don't really watch a lot of TV. I did watch a lot of the uh, Cowboy Bebop. I'm a real big fan of the old school one. Um, I think they, they like they did the most iconic episode, and then they pretty much like as like almost not quite shot for shot, but like hot, heavily inspired by the most iconic episode uh, about the Red Eye. But then, man, they've they've gone off on their own tangent, which I really like, that they kind of made it their own. They said, like, they showed it, like, yeah, we could just do shot for shot, but, like, that's not interesting, though. We could make our own show, which I think I, I really do like. And, man, Hawkeye, something, these Disney Plus Marvel shows, they just, they just uh, really have me fascinated. I love watching them. I don't know why. Uh, but, yeah, Hawkeye is really good. I really like how uh jeremy renner's is totally playing it of just like uh at one point he's like i don't have anything to sell and the uh, the cape is like no no you have to you have to have like a persona you gotta you it's know, marketing uh, <laughs> so yeah you gotta market says. better it was like and, and, and hawkeye's like yeah i'm not selling anything and like that's so man it's very refreshing to see like that kind of superhero who's just like yeah i do it because like it needs to be done i'm not out here for the glory you know it's not the uh like um uh, what do i want to say uh like, Poser, like captain america no no i'm talking like i'm trying to think of like what they call captain america like the star spangled man with a plan or something like that <laughs> yes i uh, thought you were talking about uh natasha with the pose <laughs> no, 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 not Pozu. No, I mean like, uh, uh, like he's that, or like uh, you know, uh, Thor comes in, he always slams his hammer down and like makes a big show or whatever, right? And like Hawkeye is very much not that, which I think is very interesting. So it's, I've had a lot of fun watching it. Same, same. I'm, I'm a fan. But there you go. Little, little look behind the curtain, non, non X wing, uh, stuff. Uh, let it, you know. If you guys want to talk about TV on the Discord, I don't mind as long as we're not dropping spoilers. Book of Boba Fett on the boat. It's around the corner. When's that supposed to start? December 29th, I think. Oh, Close oh to the it's end all the way till the end. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like they're 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 doing Hawkeye and then Book of Boba Fett will come out. Yeah. So, cause yeah. I think they only have one new show at a time. Uh, four, five, four more. I think it's a six part. Like yeah, uh, how Winter Soldier sounds, was. Right? Or, yeah. Uh, yeah, Falcon and Winter Soldier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped. Uh, I want to see what ships, pilots, all that stuff we're going to get out of that. Now, here are some – I would tell you here are some of the ideas. I'll tell you right now a little preview, some of the ideas I have for episodes coming coming forward. Um, I want to do a um, – a shipyard episode, a couple of those. Uh, so, for instance, you know, we've seen um, – oh, I just – her name just slipped my mind. Um, oh, Boba Fett's partner, Finn, Finn – no, it's – Fennec. Fennec, yes. Yeah, like we've seen her in The Bad Batch. If she was an x Men, what would she look like? We see her in a in like her own ship. You know, we could talk about that, speculate a little bit. We have, of course, the Bad Batch themselves, their shuttle. If we were to have that in X-Wing, what would that look like? I want to I talk about that a little bit. And with us rolling into Road, and now that we've kind of digested what it is, what's it going to look like, it's time. It's time to start List of the Week again because now 
it's time to start building lists. So can I can I make a, a request and see if they like it? Because I've been interested in this because I I've, sure. I've really enjoyed the sideboard. I have. Uh, I've enjoyed the sideboard and I enjoy uh, Jank Tank. I think everybody enjoys Jank Tank. Um, would love to do a uh, list of the week, but a mixture of Jank Tank and sideboard, sideboard where you do the random and then we take, we just keep the ships and we build off the ships. So we don't like remove one and add one. But we just oh. build out based on the ships. So we we sideboard it, basically. I think that'd be fun. I think that'd be more interesting if we pitted two lists together. Because you kind of need your opponent's list, at least, uh, oh, for like, the sideboard. Like we randomize, like, okay, me versus Dion and you versus Ryan or something like that. Yeah. That'd yeah. Be... I got four arcs and a torrent or something. And I had to find out what my sideboards upgrades are going to be, depending on who I'm faced off against. It's cool. almost like competitive list building. Yeah, I mean that's that's our thing. We like that. <laughs> alright well that's it for today everybody thank you so much for hanging out uh, remember if you're not a part of the discord come join us exclamation point discord or click the link in the description down below if you're watching uh, later on YouTube you can find it there or if you're listening on your favorite podcast app you should be able to uh, get access to uh, that description section as well um, that's all I have for you all today thanks for watching hopefully you had a good turkey day if, uh, if you celebrate Thanksgiving I know that I'm thankful for you and all your faces and your ears. That sounds weird. Whatever. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Stay smart. Stay safe. Gold Squadron out.